And I think uh, this kind of event should be an annual event. Uh, not only to share our experience, uh, Malaysian experience in uh, the development of Islam, uh, but more importantly, to foster appreciation and understanding among us. Because all of us are one Ummah. And we are all ambassadors and representatives of the Ummah. Uh, I would like to thank every one of you for choosing Malaysia to be your destination for enhancing your knowledge, broadening your uh, paradigm, and of course, more importantly, to uh, instill and try to strive for the excellence, especially in pursuing knowledge and virtues. And of course, um, on behalf of the government of Malaysia, we're always proud to uh, display our uh, Islamic image and more importantly, uh, to counter the negativities or the negative uh, perceptions towards Islam because Islam is the most misunderstood religion nowadays and of course as you have been experiencing living in Malaysia uh, we portray the true Islamic uh, approach and Islamic uh, image based on the teachings of Islam and based on the principle of moderation and when I said moderation, it is not just simply, uh, again, uh, to mislead the word moderation to mean liberal or um, try to uh, liberalize the religion. Uh, because the understanding of the concept of wasatiya is not just being moderate. As we all know, moderation by the words wasatiyah as mentioned in the Quran وَكَذَلِكَ جَعَلْنَاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَ uh, It is not just merely being moderate uh, it's neither uh, I mean, uh, condoning radical extremism on the right nor uh, liberal extremism on the left uh, but being wasatiyah means to uphold justice, uh, to portray the excellence uh, as uh, mentioned in the Quran, and balanced society, uh, neither to the right nor to the left. And more importantly, in Malaysia, as you can see, uh, the manner how we develop Islam since our independence in 1957 it has always been adopting gradualist approach or evolutionary kind of development rather than a radical uh, approach or revolutionary approach. We can see in all uh, spectrum and in all aspects of development. And the Islamic development in Malaysia is not just uh, through organic development. Uh, it comes or it derives its power from the constitution because the unique characteristics of Malaysia because we have a constitution that was developed in 1957 when we were about to gain our independence where Islam is being placed in a very significant position in the constitution for example in uh, clause 3 uh, in our constitution made it very clear that Islam is a religion of federation. It's not just for ceremonial purposes. When I say ceremonial, it's just opening the speech by reciting certain verses of the Holy Quran or just make dua and then you can just do whatever you like, even go to the extent of boundary uh, beyond the boundary of Islam. No. But the source of power that been granted in the constitution, basically it's a license for the government to implement various Islamic agenda 
in many areas. And we have been focusing very much on education first, uh, before we talk about implementing the uh, laws pertaining to Sharia in totality. Not to say that we don't have anything on Sharia. And if you, any one of you who study law, I think uh, if you go deeper to the issue of Sharia law in Malaysia, many people actually come to a conclusion that 70 to 80 percent of our law is already Islamic, except there are certain aspects which is not yet perfect, not yet Islamic, especially people always uh, say or people always mention about Hudud law. Okay? There is only perhaps 5 percent of the total Sharia law in our country. Even we have already got the provision except certain limitation when it comes to the federal uh, and state's uh, jurisdiction when it comes to Sharia matters. And, but when we look at the whole aspects of Islamic development in Malaysia, we can proudly say that uh, the experience of Malaysia in developing Islam is very progressive and exponential in nature. Why I say that? Because you look at the various sector, uh, say Islamic economic banking and finance. Uh, any one of you do a masters or PhD in this area? Raise your hand. One. Oh, okay. Uh, only one. Uh, you should come here in Malaysia because I mean one of the main uh, areas to study uh, is in Islamic banking and finance. If you want to study Islamic banking and finance, this is the best uh, country. Correct me? I'm wrong? Because uh, I'm, I'm coming from that, that area as well. Before I was forced to enter into politics. <laughs> I always mentioned uh, to people that I'm a reluctant politician. Uh, because I came from academic world and I've been practicing in Islamic banking and finance as uh, Sharia advisors, Sharia consultants. Uh, board of directors for few banks, not only uh, in Malaysia but also in uh, at the international level. But what I can say, Malaysia is the most comprehensive when it comes to Islamic finance, Islamic banking and finance. Uh, you cannot learn the application of Islamic banking and finance elsewhere. Uh, you can go to UK. I did my PhD in Islamic banking and finance in UK. What you can learn is the conventional tools and certain Sharia principles. But when it comes to application, there's not much to learn from that part of the world. Even you go to Jordan, they have Islamic economics courses in Yarmouk universities, for example. But they only have one Islamic banking and they don't have other components of Islamic finance. Because when you talk about Islamic economic banking finance, it's not just about banking. It's about the whole system. Yeah, we talk about Islamic capital market, Islamic money market, Islamic economic system, which is not only in the charity, it's not only in the commercial sector, but also in the charitable sector, because Islamic system is a comprehensive system. We don't only talk about commercial sectors like banking, finance, commerce, business, and so on. We also talk about the charitable sector or, or the social sector, uh, our kaf, wakf, uh, endowment, uh, sadaqa, zakah, uh, baitulma. This is also another dimension. But when you talk about Malaysia, we have all the components here. Huh? Talk about Islamic capital market. We are the leading country, the pioneering country when it comes to Sukuk. We introduced Sukuk when no other countries know the word of Sukuk. They, even, they don't understand what is Sukuk. Even talk to the Middle Eastern countries. They don't even know about Sukuk before. Only in 1996 and above, uh, so started to be uh, more uh, prominent in the Western world, and in the early 2000s, then only the Middle Eastern countries, especially the GCC countries, started to uh, keeping up with the development of Suku. And but Malaysia has started it ever since we started the first Islamic Bank in 1983, and because when we started Islamic Bank in 1983. We don't want it to be only one institution that offer a certain uh, Sharia-based financial product, but the back end, 
the back office are still managing funds which is mixed with uh, non-sharia funds. That's why we need capital market to be developed so that uh, we need Islamic money market to be, to be developed so that Islamic Bank is fully Sharia compliant, not only at the front end but also at the back end. Okay, so that the money that we get from people, from the industry, from the money market coming from instrument, coming from uh, generated from Sharia compliant instrument. That's why I say comprehensive system. We are we don't only focusing on banking institution, Islamic banking institution. We also have takaful as an alternative to insurance. Uh, we have Islamic capital market, Islamic money market to govern or to support the institution. We also have the legal and governance framework. We are the only country that have Islamic finance, or last time we, it is known as Islamic Banking Act, but now it has been developed into Islamic Financial Services Act that encompasses every dimension that governs the whole operation of financial industry. And the the penalty for any institution that uh, I mean that are found guilty in compromising or deemed to be uh, I mean uh, against the Sharia principles, they are found to be not Sharia compliant in their practices. They can be fined up to twenty five million ringgit or eight years imprisonment or both. This is the, the harshest penalty that you can find that you cannot find in any part of the world. We also have Sharia Advisory Council, which is placed at the very highest level at the under the under the Yandi Purtuanago, under the ruler. Meaning that whatever decision when it comes to Sharia matters, it has to go through the Sharia Advisory Council, where this as is Sharia Advisory Council is placed under the central bank as well as the Securities Commission. As or act as a secretariat for them, but they are answerable direct to Yandi Portonago because they are appointed by the Yandi Portonago, the king of the country. So this is an example how we put a very serious effort when it comes to Islamic banking and finance. And it is not, I mean, it is not uh, demand oriented uh, as experienced in Malaysia has always been a top-down approach, meaning that it has been the government initiative from the day one, not because the people want it. Why I say that? Of course, there are people who are, I mean, uh, uh, trying to pursue this agenda in the beginning, but you can see from the market share of Senate Banking Finance, in the beginning, only 1%. In 1991, it's only 7 8%. And then we put a master plan to ensure that people subscribe to Senate Banking Finance under central bank. Then in 2010, we managed to get okay, an increase of 20%. At the moment, it's about 22 to 24% market share. That's why it has never been a market driven. It has always been a government initiative. That's why to strengthen the Sharia aspects, uh, the government actually formed INSEAF, a university dedication for Islamic finance with 500 million endowment fund. And then to strengthen the Sharia aspects of Islamic finance, the government pumped in 200 million as endowment fund. I was before head of research for ISRA, International Sharia Research for Academic, uh, for International Sharia Research for Islamic Finance. Uh, this is an international outfit that are focusing mainly on how to make sure the Sharia is being adhered and every aspect of financial services. Uh, following not only to the uh, principle of Sharia on its form, but also in its substance and based on the Makassi Sharia or the objective of Sharia. This is an example in one area: Islamic economy and banking finance. Okay, and we are if we are, we are talking about Islamic agenda, it's not just looking at those agenda with Islamic labels alone. Okay, if you look beyond the Islamic labels. There are a lot of things that this government has done that can be shared to the people, to the Ummah of the world. For example, the policy to eradicate the poverty. In the beginning, when we, we gained our independence, the poverty level is up to 60%. And when we had the first I mean, um, ever experienced racial tension in 1969, that is because uh, uh, 
uh, empty stomach can easily and uh, instigate uh, tension and prejudices within this, I mean, fragile community. When I say fragile community, because Malaysia has, Malaysia is not, I mean, a uh, solid uh, Muslim majority country. Uh, the Muslims is about 60%. Uh, even though we always claim that this is Islamic country, but Muslims only representing by, represented by 50%, uh, 60%. And we have diversified or diverse, uh, I mean, background of religion as well as races. And of course, if you look at the history, we had that ever, I mean, experience in 1969. That, is, that was due to the imbalance of economic cake that was shared among the society. And those who claim that, for example, the Bumiputra or the Malays, who basically, I mean, uh, owner of this land in the beginning, when we gained our independence, we had uh, the understanding with the British to accept okay, those coming from China, those coming from India, as part of our citizen. Okay? But in return, they have to recognize certain things that is crafted and stipulated in the constitution. Among others, they have to recognize that Islam is the religion of federation. They have to recognize certain privileges, okay? certain privileges that have to be given to the, uh, to the Bumiputra or to the Malays. Right? And this must be done by also having what is known as affirmative action. And that was only done after we realized that since our independence up to 1969, not much effort is done to, to correct the imbalance of status of economy and social uh, in the country. That's why at that point in time, 1969, our poverty level is more than 50%, nearly 60%, and most of the Malay Muslims were among the, uh, I mean, the highest uh, population, I mean, the highest uh, percentage of poverty. So what the government did is to introduce a policy known as a new economic policy with two objectives, to eradicate the poverty regardless of their races, and second, to basically to restructure the, uh, the society so that they are not identified, the races are not identified based on uh, economic identity. Eh? Because last time, during British colonial period, eh, the Chinese are given the opportunities of doing business in the city, whereas the Malay in the kampong or in the villages and Indian in the estates. So when you identify economy based on races, eh, you create that gap in the economy. That's why, okay, uh, even though the majority are Malay, Bumiputra, Muslims, but they are eh, at the back end when it comes to economic position. So that's why the, the sense of prejudices, the sense of um, uh, unhappiness among the community, I mean, uh, started to uh, instigate it and what happened in 1969, after that the government introduced this new economic policy. After 20 years of implement implementation, we managed to reduce from 60% of poverty level to below 10%. Now it's about 2 to 3%. That is hardcore poverty, eh? or I would say a relative poverty. Not the real, I mean, if you talk about poverty, poor, it's almost zero. So that is also another, I mean, uh, success story. And if you go through this dimension or these aspects, you can see what are the projects and programs that was introduced by the government, that has been introduced by the government. For example, FELDA is one of the most successful stories uh, that the government, I mean, of this country can share with the people how we I mean, allocate those who are poor, and but we are not giving them fish, but we give them rot to teach them how to fish. And more importantly, we build the infrastructure so that they can earn for living and can be independent. And that's why nowadays, uh, this project has been I mean, um, a symbol of success, how Malaysia eradicated poverty. And this is also Islam. You cannot just say, oh, without the label of Islam, 
then we only concern about those institutions with the level of Islam to, to, to reflect the Islamic agenda. Eradication of poverty is part of the I mean, uh, Islamic agenda, as mentioned by the Prophet. Because uh, poverty can lead to kufur, uh, disbelief. So this is one of the important principles that uh, I mean, the government uh, uh, put in place so that we make sure that everything is in line with Islamic principle. Okay? So that is the economic part. If you talk about more um, apparent approach or initiative made by the government when it comes to Islamic uh, initiative, you can see no other countries actually uh, spend billions of ringgit every year okay, through our budget uh, that was, I mean, that has been uh, debated, in the, uh, debated and approved in parliament. And billions here, including uh, spending to support, eh, because we pay the allowances for all the imams eh, for the whole countries, from Kelantan to Sarawak. Eh. You can see all our imams, about 14,400 imams in Malaysia, okay, is, I mean, uh, paid, they are under the payroll of the government, eh, meaning that they are, their allowances are paid by the government. Not only that, Okay, we also pay for what we call as Guru Guru Kafa, Kafa teachers that teach Fadu'ain and Quran to the, uh, to the children eh, at the various, uh, I mean, uh, throughout the country. Eh? And these uh, teachers, we have about 36,000 eh, Kafa teachers that we pay them eh, allowances eh, throughout the nation. And we also pay for those who preach Islam in the mosque every day, eh, those who basically uh, teach Quran, teach Hadith, teach Sharia, teach all religious matters in the mosque, eh, between Maghrib and Isha, eh, they were eh, given 100 ringgit per one hour, eh, every day, okay? and they, claim, they can claim up to 8 hours per month. Eh? So this is also under Jakim, uh, we were allocated 500 million this year to distribute okay, for the imams, for the teachers that teach the Quran, for the children, for the teachers to teach the Sharia, the Islamic teachings in the mosque. And this is under the government's payroll. Okay? And that is only to, 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 make, to reflect certain effort made under the Jakim, under my purview. Okay? And in education, for example, okay, you can see that we are the, among, among the Muslim countries, there have been studies that shows that Malaysia spend a lot of, I mean, I mean, the budget of the country for education purposes. Although this year we have to cut, how many percent? 20 percent? Huh? 20 percent. That is because of the, uh, the oil prices and so on. The mishap that is beyond the control of the uh, government is because of the external factors. But even that, okay, we maintain our commitment when it comes to Islamic teachings. Uh, we have, we formalize all Islamic subjects, teachings in primary school, secondary school. Uh, we fund even uh, uh, religious schools. Uh, we have more than 200 religious schools throughout the countries. And we have 52,200 religious teachers. And their, their status is equivalent to any other teachers under the Ministry of Education. And this is just to show you an example how serious and, I mean, uh, direct initiative of the government to ensure that and the Islamic agenda or the Islamization process can be uh, realized not through revolutionary approach, but through evolutionary approach, gradualist approach. Because we feel that when people have the real and true understanding of Islam, there can be I mean, they can practice and promote Islam in a better manner. They can actually propagate Islam in a true manner, not, I mean, easily being radicalized eh, because of eh, to enter a shortcut way to Jannah, for example. So this is, a, I mean, it's just an example how uh, we actually, um, I mean, uh, develop the Islamic uh, agenda in Malaysia. 
And again, I want to stress, what are the source of power? Because we have a clear uh, mandate from the constitution. Yeah, you can see in many other countries uh, that if in the constitution mention a word of a secular, you cannot easily do things which relates to Islam. We as Muslims, yeah, we, are, we should be more wisdom when it comes to uh, how to realize the noble objectives of Sharia, how to, we want to realize the philosophy, the principle of Islam uh, in reality, especially with all sorts of perceptions towards us. Okay? Sometimes we are very much focusing on the forms rather than the substance. And Muslims should project the true image of Islam by focusing more on the substance rather than the form. And I think this is where we need all of you uh, to be our ambassadors, not ambassadors to talk good about Malaysia. Not That is not our objective. But our objective is to share the spirit of realization of Islam in all walks of life, in all aspects of life. And because we are one Ummah, regardless whether you are coming from this, I mean, you are coming from, uh, I mean, any countries, but more importantly, because we share the same principles, idealism, we share the same philosophy, and that we are all Muslims. And as mentioned by Allah in the Quran, in mu'minuna ikhwah. Every one of us is brothers and sisters. And regardless of our, I mean, uh, uh, races, our country of origins, but more importantly, we share the same agenda. And we need to promote this agenda to bring back the, the Islamic civilization and what is being promoted by Islam Hadari, for example. And we have to promote the, the true Islamic civilization. And this true Islamic, Islamic civilization can only be realized if we truly promote the true teachings of Islam derived from its original source, the Quran and the Sunnah. Not based on polemics, not based on the petty, petty things. We have to agree to disagree certain aspects of religion that are, I mean, open for us to have differences. And because it's God purposely, certain things he made it very clear, certain things he made it open for us to, to be more innovative and creative to suit our main mundane affairs. And that's why Allah says, you know, in, uh, Allah says in the Quran, uh, uh, if Allah wills, uh, Allah, will, Allah definitely has the ability to create and we as one nation. But Allah actually said, وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدًا وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ And but He created us into tribes and nations. He created us with, I mean, the faculty of thinking so that we have our own, I mean, our own mind, our own desire. And different of, I mean, different people have different uh, interests. And that is okay. The most important thing, how we can actually tolerate each other. How we should actually understand each other. As mentioned in Surah Al-Hujrat, Ya ayyuhal nas, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarim wa untha, wa ja'alnakum shu'uban wa qaba'ila li ta'arafu. The main purpose of Allah created us into men and women, tribes and nation, for us to li ta'arafu, to know each other. What does it mean to know each other? To respect each other. To respect each other's differences. It's not to respect each other's similarities only, but also to respect their differences. And this is where Islam actually comes with the clear teachings. That's why I mentioned we have to go back to the original teachings of Islam. Okay? So that we know the boundaries where we can be different and where we have to strive together as one ummah. Okay? So with that, I would like to end my speech today um, by Wabillah Taufiq Wal Hidayah. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Okay. Dalam konteks pembangunan Islam, rata-rata mereka sebenarnya mereka berbangga dengan dan mereka dapat membezakan antara uh, perkembangan 
uh, Islam di negara kita dengan negara-negara luar daripada perlembagaan perkara tiga mengatakan Islam sebagai agama Islam membolehkan kita melaksanakan pelbagai agenda Islam baik daripada pendidikan, ekonomi, uh, sosial, perundangan, pentadbiran. Perkembangan Islam di Malaysia berbanding dengan negara-negara Islam lain uh, ia adalah diterajui dan dijadikan agenda utama oleh kerajaan. Uh, kenapa negara-negara Islam berterusan menghantar pelajar-pelajar mereka dan menjadikan Malaysia sebagai destinasi utama? kerana mereka dapat melihat sendiri perkembangan Islam di Malaysia.